Wonderful. Thank you very much. Julia Firewood and Mark North Thomas. Starting the week right here on the panel RNZ National. I'm with you right through 3.45. Talk tomorrow. See you then. This is Checkpoint on RZ National. I'm Lisa Owen. Yeah, Heidi Akine going down alert levels and COVID cases. It's official. Everyone south of Auckland moves to level three midnight tomorrow. But the super city is banged up for at least another two weeks. All 53 new Delta cases today are in Auckland. There's some reprieve for Northland. If it's still all clear, it drops to level three two midnight Thursday. Meanwhile, a North Shore naval base has COVID in its way. Water. A death here is linked to the Pfizer vaccine, but officials say the shot is safe and people shouldn't put off getting it. Right now, though, demand for the vaccination is so high, the government's look- looking at how to manage the rush. Don't forget, you can catch us live on Facebook and Freeview Channel 50. Ahi ahi marie, RNZ News at 5. Ko Sarah Thompson, thōko ingoa. Auckland is set to stay in Level 4 lockdown for another two weeks until midnight on Tuesday, September 14th. The rest of New Zealand south of Auckland will move to Level 3 from 11.59pm tomorrow. Northland is likely to join the rest of the country at Level 3 from 11.59pm on Thursday. The Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern says Auckland is doing the rest of the country a huge service. It's Auckland that has maintained our gateway to the world, that has done a lot of the heavy lifting and welcoming Kiwis home safely, that has worked hard to keep the rest of New Zealand safe when there has been an outbreak. Auckland has done it tough, and they've done it tough for all of us. Cabinet will consider the next step for the Auckland region on Monday, September 13th. Today there are 53 new cases of COVID-19, down from yesterday's high of 83. The Director-General of Health, Ashley Bloomfield, says that's an encouraging sign, but it's just one data point. He says there are other encouraging signs, however, including the small number of exposure events. Of yesterday's cases, Dr Bloomfield says 52% of them were household contacts of an existing case. And of yesterday's 83 cases, 72% did not create any new exposure events, implying that they have been isolating since lockdown started and thus reducing the potential for new chains of transmission. Ashley Bloomfield says only 28% of cases are considered to have been infectious in the community, which may have included visiting a supermarket or being an essential worker. The country has recorded its first death linked to the Pfizer vaccine, but experts say COVID itself carries a far greater risk. The Vaccine Monitoring Board says the woman developed fatal myocarditis, a swelling of part of the heart, probably as a result of the vaccine. Health correspondent Rowan Quinn reports. The board is reminding health staff to be aware of the rare side effect which can cause chest pain, a racing heart or difficulty breathing. Otago University professor and World Health Organisation advisor Peter McIntyre says the case is tragic, but he says there is a much higher risk of getting the condition and many other serious symptoms from COVID itself. He says that means the benefits of being vaccinated far outweigh the risks. A Pacifica leader says he's saddened that efforts to boost Pacific community engagement with COVID vaccination have been set back. Members of Bay of Plenty's Pacific community were wrongly asked for their passports at a vaccine appointment. Pakilo Manase Lua, who chairs the Pacific Leadership Forum, says people can see past the mistake. All it takes is one stupid mistake like this and it sets us back a huge way because... We've got undocumented people who have been reassured even by the the Prime Minister herself on numerous occasions. Anyone on New Zealand soil is free to get a vaccine, you know, without questions asked. Ashley Bloomfield says there was no intention to single out a particular group. He says the mishap had something to do with trying to figure out NHI numbers. The National Party leader Judith Collins is defending her decision to fly from Auckland to Wellington to attend Parliament. A socially distanced Parliament with just a handful of MPs from each party will resume sitting tomorrow. 
Ms Collins says question time is the opposition's only chance to scrutinise the government. The government has had an opportunity to bring in place, put in place the Epidemic Response Committee, which could have had the sort of scrutiny that we normally get in question time, and they have refused steadfastly, totally blocked any suggestion of that, and that would have avoided any of this. Judith Collins says she can't expect other essential workers to show up to their jobs if she won't do the same herself. It's four minutes past five. Moving now into sport, the format for next year's Super Rugby season has finally been confirmed, with Moana Pacifica and the Fijian Indrua joining the five New Zealand and Australian sides. Super Rugby Pacific will start in February with a 15-week regular season followed by quarterfinals, semifinals and a final. Sports editor Stephen Hewson reports. The competition marks a turning point with the introduction of the two Pacific sides. The 12 teams will play 14 regular season matches, with each team hosting seven games. Teams will play eight teams once and three teams twice, with an emphasis on derby matches, meaning the conference system has been abandoned. The top eight teams will qualify for a three-week playoff format, with the final on June the 18th. Moana Pacifica will be based in Auckland, while the Endura expect to announce just where they'll play their home games later this week. The New Zealand swimmer Sophie Pascoe will defend her 100 metres backstroke title at the Paralympics in Tokyo tonight. Pascoe, who won the S9 event in Rio, has qualified third fastest after finishing second in her heat. Jessie Reynolds qualified sixth fastest pardon me, sixth fastest for the S9 100 backstroke final, which is also tonight. And finally, Wooden Spooners, the Waikato Bay of Plenty Magic, will be a force to be reckoned with come next year's ANZ Netball Premiership with another international signing. Defender Katrina Rory will join fellow New Zealand players Amelia Ann Ekinacio, Bailey Mears and Claire Kirsten at the franchise. And that's the news. Hurricane Ida strikes. The reports we're getting are that in Grand Isle, Louisiana, that the wind gauge hit 148 and then flew away. Is it time for alert level five? We've had such dramatic examples of how this virus could be transmitted by just fleeting contact. And an orca mission in lockdown. We must make sure that people stay under level four. We certainly don't want Toa's legacy to be an outbreak of COVID. Part of your pod. Morning report weekdays from six on RNZ National. Te reo irirangi o Aotearoa, funded through New Zealand On Air. Now the short forecast from Met Service to Midnight Ra to Tuesday. For Northland, Auckland and the Coromandel Peninsula, scattered rain with some heavy falls and possible thunderstorms easing later tomorrow. For Waikato, Waitomo, Taumaranui, Bay of Plenty and Taupo, fine breaks and isolated showers. For Gisborne to Wairarapa, mostly cloudy with isolated showers. For Taranaki to Wellington, including Taihape, Scattered showers clearing this afternoon and fine breaks increasing. The odd shower possible about the Wellington south coast again tomorrow morning. For Nelson, Buller, Westland and Fiordland, mostly sunny. A few showers about western Fiordland tomorrow. For Marlborough and Canterbury, cloudy periods. Isolated showers clearing this evening except about the Kaikoura coast. For Otago and Southland, areas of cloud clearing and becoming fine this afternoon. And for the Chatham Islands, cloudy periods with showers developing early tomorrow. That concludes the short forecast from Met Service to midnight R2 Tuesday. It's seven minutes past five. Thanks, Sarah. Tēnā koutou kato, no mai haere mai ki checkpoint i tēnei rā, ko Lisa Owen tēnei. An extra two weeks in lockdown has been locked in for Tamaki Makoto as it braces to bear the brunt of the latest Delta outbreak. There were 53 new community cases today, all in Auckland, bringing the total number of active cases to 562. After meeting today, Cabinet confirmed Auckland will remain in lockdown an extra two weeks, while the rest of the country, bar Northland will move to alert level three at midnight Tuesday. Te Pirimia, Jacinda Ardern says today's case numbers are encouraging. While it would be too premature to say we have a trend yet, what we can say is level four is making a difference. We are seeing a decrease in cases outside of households, a decreasing number of locations of interest and the reproduction rate reducing. Now all of that helps but the job is not yet done and we do need to keep going. 
The Prime Minister explained why Cabinet now feels comfortable to relax restrictions outside Auckland. Why do wastewater testing in Christchurch has not shown up any further positive results, meaning the positive results last week we believe can be most likely attributed to cases in managed isolation facilities in the city. And additional testing across the country has only thrown up one additional positive case in Wellington, a household contact of an existing case who was already in isolation and not in the community. Businesses that can safely reopen under Alert Level 3 will now spring into action as they prepare to trade again on Wednesday. Level 3 does not mean freedom. It means caution. It means staying in your bubble. It means distance. It means contactless transactions. And while you're moving, preparing to move into Level 3, Auckland is doing a huge service for all of us. It's Auckland that has maintained our gateway to the world, that has done a lot of the heavy lifting and welcoming Kiwis home safely, that has worked hard to keep the rest of New Zealand safe when there has been an outbreak. Auckland has done it tough, and they've done it tough for all of us. Cabinet will meet again to review the alert level settings, including those regions at alert level three in a week's time. Northland will stay in alert level four for another few days while health officials monitor the recent cases in Walkworth. The region will likely drop to alert level three on Thursday night. Ko taku hoa i nai nei, ko Nita Blake person who joins us live from Whangarei. Nita, what's this going to mean for travel out of Northland? Well, if we do go down to Alert Level 3 on Friday, it won't immediately mean a heck of a lot. That's because Alert Level 3 or Alert Level 4 interregional travel isn't happening. So uh, that does signal we're being kind of decoupled and, and hopefully cut off from Auckland, but people aren't going to be rushing in or rushing out unless it's essential travel. If, though, we start to move further down the alert levels, for example, we make it to alert level two while Auckland stays possibly in alert level four, that's when things uh, could create a bit of an issue with moving in and out of the region. So business leaders are looking for some real assurance around that, whether it be a, a, a corridor or some type of guarantee that Northland will be able to interact and do business with the rest of the country without being blocked by Auckland and you know become a bit of an island at the top of the country. Looks like a pretty stunning day there, Anita. I'm not sure if you've had an opportunity to talk to anybody who's out on their walk, but what's the general reaction been? The sun has come out for this good news and people are generally really pleased about it so far. Uh, health leaders, they're pleased because it gives kind of a bit of a buffer um, with that extra wastewater testing and the extra contact testing that they're allowing for later this week. If that all comes back negative, then health staff are feeling quite confident we should be in alert level three. Business leaders, they're pleased because we're moving in the right direction. Obviously, so many businesses want to be safely in the lowest alert levels possible. So. We're starting to get in line with the rest of the country and I guess it's a tiny little bit more freedom uh, for the rest of Northland takeaways or whatever it might be uh, to bring us in line with the rest of the country. So yes, the sun is out for hopefully a bit of good news for Northland today. Thanks, Nita. Nita Blakeperson joining us live there from Whangarei. Homai o Fakaro, we would love your feedback. Nō reira ānei na kaupapa mō te hōtaka nei. What do you think about the alert level decisions today? Another two weeks for Auckland for sure. Northland potentially down to level three on Thursday, uh, if its results are clear, the wastewater. And south of Auckland, moving from midnight tomorrow. Patui mai, text me 2101, tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ, or you can flick us an email, checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. It is almost 13 minutes past five, and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. Ki ora rawatu mo te whakarongo mai. E haere ake nei, coming up on the programme, the COVID response minister, Chris Hipkins, joins us live. Delta has been discovered in the wastewater at a North Shore naval base, which has come as a shock to some locals. The Narrow Neck Barracks are a stone's throw from Devonport, where the first known Delta case lives. An epidemiologist believes there's one overwhelmingly likely explanation for the positive case. Here's our reporter Nick Trubridge and cameraman Nick Monroe. 
Devonport's home to the first case that emerged in this country's rampant Delta outbreak. Now, after being detected in the wastewater at the nearby Narrowneck Naval Base, the virus is again front of mind for those in the area. Myself, I'm completely unaware of the wastewater issue that you've just mentioned to me in the Naval Base, and um, that comes as a real shock to me, I have to say, given that we live quite close to this gateway here. Nothing's really surprising these days, is it? Like, of course, things are going to expand around the country and stuff like that, so uh, it wasn't too much of a surprise. You've got to let the testing kind of take it, run its course here, you, you know, and, and see how that kind of traces back to MIQ or whatever and not leap to any conclusions um, too quickly. A Defence Force spokesman told Checkpoint the positive case was found in wastewater specifically linked to the base's accommodation and training facility. Tests on 54 junior officers and ratings living there have come back negative, with eight outstanding. The Navy base here at Narrowneck has been well and truly locked down. The gate completely shut off. A single security guard is stationed out front. Now the fence along the perimeter of this base stretches about 500 metres down Vauxhall Road just to my left. There's a number of barracks behind me, a number of accommodation wings. We haven't seen anyone leave any of those wings at any time. As for the location, well, it's right next door to Narrow Neck Beach. It's also just a couple of minutes down the road from Devonport. That is, of course, where case A in this outbreak is from. Otago University professor Nick Wilson says in all likelihood there's one reason COVID was detected in the wastewater. The, the only really plausible uh, explanation is that you know, there is someone on the, in that facility uh, that is infected um, or uh, they have recovered from their infection and are still uh, excreting uh, virus. Given the outbreak situation in Auckland, it's most likely to be uh, someone who's actually still infectious. NZDF has confirmed the positive results showed up last Wednesday and the base has been in lockdown ever since. Another wastewater sample was taken on Thursday and returned a negative result. With some staff due to work MIQ shifts, the Navy's called in personnel to replace those due to start MIQ duty. Meanwhile, Takapuna Devonport Community Board member George Wood says the presence of case A in his neck of the woods was already cause for concern. I think the biggest issue that our communities on the North Shore are concerned about is the impact on small businesses and, you know, some businesses being closed and others selling the same commodities being allowed to stay open. As for the locked-down Narrowneck Naval Base, Mr Wood really worries for the young naval staff. Those people, those service men and women who are, are having to man those MIQ facilities, uh, it's, it's, it's a real worry that um, they're putting themselves and their health and, and on the line um, and, you know, I think that's the biggest problem that we would face. But as for them going and coming and staying in the area, well, that's their business and the business of the uh, Ministry of Defence. Checkpoint has asked the Defence Force whether staff based at Narrowneck are required to isolate after MIQ shifts. We also want to know which MIQ facilities they'd worked at, specifically whether there were any links to the Crown Plaza. We're still awaiting the Defence Force's response. And the Defence Force has just sent us a statement which says the majority of the NZDF personnel involved with the isolation at Narrow Neck are Navy trainees and Navy personnel not involved with managed isolation. It says staff are isolated in an accommodation block specifically allocated for this person, uh, for this purpose rather, away from other Navy personnel. All personnel in this block undertook swab testing and have now all returned negative COVID-19 test results. But their isolation continues. If you are listening to that um, report from our two Nicks on radio, we'll also put that on our Facebook page so you can check out the video. It is 17 minutes past five. Kia mō tonu mai. You are listening to Checkpoint on RNZ National. Northland has a few more days in the toughest COVID restrictions and will likely drop to alert level three on Thursday. The Prime Minister says the extra days will allow time for wastewater testing to come in and will give health authorities confidence there's no COVID cases in the region. Well, joining me now is Whangarei Mayor Cheryl Mai. Kia ora, Cheryl. Are you happy with this decision? 
Tēnā koe, Lisa. Yes, we are pleased that we'll be joining the rest of the country at Alert Level 3, uh, assuming that those test results continue to come through negative. Do you think you could have been moved down sooner, like the rest of the country south of Auckland, if more had been done to protect you guys in the first place? And by that I mean people filtering into your district when they shouldn't have been. I think some of the uh, the, the cases, the, the anecdotal stuff about Northlanders, uh, sorry, Aucklanders coming north in their droves is probably a little overstated. Yes, there were some people who came through uh, probably in the middle of the night and um, and came came north, but I don't think it's as uh, significant as the 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 cases in Walkworth that are being looked at and have the potential for their close contacts to have come north. Cheryl, have you been consulted about where the border exactly will be when this happens? At the last lockdown, the Merrill Forum uh, did ask the DPMC or Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet to look specifically at the, when, when the alert levels are different between Auckland and Northland. When that happens, of course, we become isolated from the rest of the country. So we did specifically ask to, to address that particular issue. And my understanding now is that we will have the border patrols at a really appropriate place where there is um, uh, not, not going to impact people who maybe live in Mangafai, who are in Northland, but uh, may have been you know, termed as an Aucklander. So you know, there, there are some border issues that has been resolved, and I'm confident that it will be work- workable from here on in. So Cheryl, is it your understanding that Mangafai, if there is an alert level change, will remain in the Northland catchment? Yes. Okay. So how complicated is this to have that border and well to to get freight and to get essential workers back back and forward? What arrangements are being made as far as you know for safe passage as your colleague the far north mayor calls it? So alert level three and four are exactly the same for for business related transport p- purposes. Not a problem at all. You just need to be. It needs to be very evident that you are on business related uh, travel between regions, and that's the same. That goes for the up and down the country. The issue is that when when uh, other when we drop down alert levels and we want to be able to get through to other parts of the country that are at, at the same alert level, then if Auckland is at a higher alert level, then we have difficulty getting through with with a, a travel passage. So that is that's where the the conundrum lies is when Northland and uh, Waikato, for example, at the same alert level, but Auckland is higher. That means that we can't get through that isthmus of, of Auckland without being um, through working on essential travel. How is this um, affecting you guys economically? Oh, it, it, there's no doubt about it. Um, for, for the whole country, uh, when you can't do your business, that impacts the economy. And um, I appreciate all of the work that's gone into from the government to support wage subsidies and all of the business support. But yes, th- no doubt about it. Um, uh, businesses are, will be hurting and some will go to the wall as a result. Maria, food banks have been talking about exceptionally high demand in Whangarei. Are you getting the help that you need? Yes, I do believe we are getting the help that we need. It just the 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 difference between last lockdown and this lockdown is, is quite evident. There's a sense of um, not so not so much of a well-being. There's a there's a um, a real concern in the in the community. But we we do have the uh, the support networks in place, and it's important that people do know that they can get help when they need it. It's um, uh, it, it is well supported. So. Yes, there's more demand, and yes, there is more supply. Appreciate your time this evening. That is Cheryl Mai, who is the Whangarei Mayor. So, just to recap, the whole country south of the Auckland border will move to COVID Alert Level 3 from midnight tonight. Northam will stay hitched to Auckland in Alert Level 4 for another few days before dropping to Level 3 on Thursday night. Ko taku manuhiri in INA, ko Chris Hipkins, the COVID Response Minister. Good evening, Minister. Good evening. So is it really two more weeks for Auckland in Level 4? Are you just trying to soften the blow because there's another two weeks coming after that? Oh, look, it is too hard to tell at this point. We we saw an encouraging drop in the number of cases uh, today compared to yesterday and the days prior to that. If we see that trend sustained, that'll be very good news. But at this point, it's just too early to tell.
But you can't rule out that, well, the super city is going to be spending another two weeks on top of this two weeks at level four. Look, at this point, I just wouldn't want to speculate on that. So you can't rule it out? Of, of course not. I mean, you can't rule anything okay. out with COVID-19, really. So Northland, if all is well with tests on midnight Thursday, they'll go to level three. Where exactly is the border? Is Mungify going to be in the Northland catchment? I'm sorry, I don't have the, the, the border in front of me. I know that one of the things that the team do uh, when they determine where the border is going to be is they look at uh, people movement, so where people live and where they work, and they try and make sure that they're getting the border in as clean a place as possible so that there's as little movement across the border uh, as possible. I'm sorry, I just don't have the map in front of me to be able to draw a, a, a clear line. What about the border south of Auckland? Because, again, um, we've already had feedback saying uh, northwest Waikato finds itself included in Auckland despite needing farm services in Huntley and Hamilton. This is ridiculous. The checkpoints are north of us, but the boundary is south. That's from a listener. Can you tell us where the southern border will be? Um, like I said, I haven't got the map in front of me, but there have been some adjustments to the border uh, based on feedback that we got last time around who should be in and who should be out. Uh, so in some cases, it actually made more sense to have uh, some of the smaller, more isolated pockets in the alert level four than out of it, uh, because if you had them out of it, you're effectively making them very isolated and very cut off. So uh, work, work is continuing to happen on refining exactly where the where the border goes. Uh, and of course, that information is publicly available. Uh, it, it is released. I just don't have it in front of me right at this very moment. OK, it's 37 people in hospital, three of them ventilated. Is it correct that modelling is suggesting that you'll get a hospital peak this th the end of this week and the weekend? It's still too hard to tell. What we the feedback that we're getting from our health teams uh, is that uh, the, the the rate of illness from this current outbreak is higher than the rate of illness that we've seen in previous outbreaks. So people who are getting sick are getting sicker than they have been in previous outbreaks. So it is possible that we will see more hospitalisations as a result. Is North Shore setting up a separate facility for COVID cases? Uh, all of the hospitals will be making sure that they're keeping their cases isolated uh, from other um, patients and other... other but Minister, workers. do you know, because of the load of cases in hospital, whether extra facilities are being set up at our hospitals to deal with COVID-19 cases? Because they need special care, as you know, negative pressure rooms, and demand is very high. Are you close to running out of negative pressure rooms? Ultimately, how patients are accommodated in hospitals is a matter for the hospitals. But yes, I do expect that they're looking at how they can make sure they've got the capacity uh, to accommodate an increased number of cases if that's what we continue to see. Prime Minister said we've got 840,000 doses of the Pfizer vaccine. At current rates, that will be gone in less than two weeks because you're doing 500,000 injections a week. So are you moving to rationing? We're getting at least 300,000 doses, more than 300,000 doses being delivered each week. Uh, we're in conversations about making sure that we are getting, uh, we're, we're exploring all of the avenues uh, to see if we can increase that through the month of September. In October, we go up to uh, much, much bigger deliveries uh, every week, and we're expecting about 4 million doses, more than 4 million doses overall in October. Yeah, but that's so, not until October. And the Prime Minister stated today that you're doing 500,000 vaccinations a week. You've got 840,000 doses currently in the country. The mass is not hard. That will run out in less than two weeks if you continue to vaccinate at the rate you are going. So are you about to slow down? Well, well I think your math there doesn't factor in that we are still going to be getting weekly deliveries each week during that period of time. Did you ask Pfizer to slow down on the deliveries of COVID vaccinations? No, not at all. You absolutely did not request that they slow down on the delivery. Oh, no, quite the opposite, in fact. We've been asking them if we can get uh, any deliveries any earlier than what the delivery schedule is. So when the Prime Minister talks about managing demand and returning to our previous settings, what does that mean? You start telling 30-year-olds and 40-year-olds to tie haul and not come in for the jab? No, I think, uh, let's be clear about what the challenge is here. The challenge is that the demand for vaccines is continuing to grow. Uh, it's not that we are going to run out of vaccines to meet the demand that we had planned for. So we'd, we'd, we had a, a model there that was going to deliver 50 to 60 But the point is, Minister, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but the point is you have a different demand right now. You have a demand of around 500,000 a week. So the reality is you cannot keep pace with that, correct? 
Well, we have a model that, are, that will mean that we can comfortably deliver 50 to 60,000 vaccines per day. Which uh, is so not what you are currently vaccinating at. And again, Minister, I'm sorry to interrupt, but let's deal with the figures that are actually real and happening. At the moment, you're getting around 90,000 people a day and 500,000 um, on average a week since the Delta outbreak. So the demand is much, much higher. You cannot meet the demand at that level, can you, Minister? So the average that we did over the last week was about 75,000 a day on average over the last week. So you, see, you do see peaks and troughs and obviously 90,000 was the peak at the, uh, over the last week and it, I think the low point was on, was yesterday on Sunday where it dropped down to 40-something thousand. So across the course of the week it was about 75,000 on average. Uh, we are looking to see whether there are ways that we can uh, get supply into the country in a, in a, working with Pfizer uh, to get supply into the country to sustain an average of that rate. Uh, what if ways? we can't, worst, worst case scenario is if we can't, then we drop back to an average uh, more like 65,000 a day, 60 to, 60 to 65,000 a day, which we would be able so to So you will to be sustain. turning people away. Worst case scenario, you will be turning people away based on what well, you've no. just said. Well, we, we might not be doing all of the uh, walk-ins and the drive-throughs that we're doing at the moment, but we're absolutely, uh, our booking system is uh, absolutely running hot, but it's also being designed so that we would never have to cancel bookings. So uh, we know that we've got the supply. That's still turning to... people away. If people walk up for a vaccination, you don't have it to give to them. That's still turning people away, Minister. Well, we, even now, even doing 90,000 a day, I mean, the, the demand is potentially, you know, uh, the, the, of, we've, of the, you know, two and a half million New Zealanders who've not yet got a vaccine, we can't vaccinate them all in a single day. So we are going to be turning people away if they all want it at the same time. Have we got any Janssen or AstraZeneca in the country? Uh, no, not at this point. OK. MIQ, still frozen. When are you going to take the freeze off and release more vouchers? At the moment, the challenge is accommodating the domestic cases that we are dealing with. So we are seeing uh, an increased number of people who are having to isolate in our MIQ facilities as a result of this outbreak. Uh, we've had to repurpose two of our MIQ facilities already into either community isolation or quarantine or a combination of both. And that puts the system under quite a bit of pressure. We keep it under review, but it is likely to be several weeks before we're in a position to be releasing any significant number of additional vouchers. So will vouchers be released for December, which is obviously going to be a peak month? Uh, look, we will be releasing November uh, further vouchers for November and vouchers for December in due course. We haven't made a, a decision on exactly when that will be yet. But if you're saying several weeks, what are you talking, a couple, two months before you make that decision? Uh, no, not at all. I mean, I think those vouchers for November and December, we'd be wanting to release them uh, within the next... Well, we'll be, we'll be wanting to have conversations about when we release them within the next few weeks uh, because, uh, you know, that, that's a lot of vouchers. But the, the real pressure is around uh, the vouchers for the... You know, are we releasing any further vouchers for, say, you know, September and October? Uh, and at this point, we're holding back on that uh, because we don't know how many domestic cases we're going to need to accommodate during that time. School has been out, Minister, since about the 17th of August, right? There's two more weeks for Auckland at Level 2. You can't rule out, uh, Level 4, you can't rule out we're going to have another two weeks on top of that. And then that would bring us right up to the school holidays. So are you signalling to parents in Auckland now that they should prepare, well, to have had their kids home for two months before they go back to school? Uh, well, th th those maths uh, are exactly what the maths are. Um, we are doing everything we can to try and support uh, families to ensure that their kids can continue to learn from home. Uh, but yes, though, th th that analysis is about right. So potentially prepare to have your children home for two months in Auckland. Uh, including the time that they have been home already. But look, at this point, uh, you know, uh, we're in for two more weeks. What happens beyond that? At this point, I don't want to speculate. But of course, we do start to get up closer to school holidays and people will be doing those maths. Is there any prospect that you could shift the school holidays in the Auckland area? I uh, haven't considered that yet. Um, we did do some movement of the school holidays last year, but that's not something we've considered at this point. Minister, just before you go, have you asked any other countries whether they can sell you some Pfizer vaccine? Uh, like I said, we're exploring a range of options uh, to Is ensure that Is that one of them? Can, uh, look, we, we're exploring a range of options. Is that one of them, more, Minister? We should have more to say on that in the next few days. So that's a yes, you've asked other countries for Pfizer? Uh, look, I'm not going to confirm or deny that, but I'm saying we're exploring the options we have to get more vaccines into the country faster.
Thanks for joining us. That is Chris Hipkins, who is the COVID Response Minister. Ete iwi e hairinaki nei i a checkpoint. Health officials insist the Pfizer COVID vaccine is safe following the death of a woman likely caused by the jab. Auckland schools brace for the rest of Term 3 to be virtual and a warning about buy now, pay later schemes. Homai o whakaro, we would love your feedback. Let us know what your thoughts are on the schooling situation potentially. Chris Hipkins, the COVID minister, suggesting there that Auckland parents may find themselves with kids home for two months. Text us on 2101, tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ or email checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. Also interested in your thoughts on the government managing demand for COVID vaccinations. It is time for the headlines now. Ane a Sarah, mina pita pita kōrero. Kia ora, Lisa. RNZ News Headlines. Ko Sarah Thompson, tōko ingoa. Auckland's mayor believes most residents will understand why the city has to remain in Level 4 for another two weeks. Tāmaki Makaurau will be in lockdown until midnight on Tuesday, September the 14th, while the rest of the country south of the city moves to Level 3 from 11.59pm tomorrow. Mayor Phil Goff says for Auckland to get back to normal life as quickly as possible, the lockdown has to stay in place until the spread of the virus has been contained. Meanwhile, Whangare Mayor Cheryl Mai says there is a sense the outbreak is changing and she is hoping Cabinet does decide to drop Northland down to Level 3 on Thursday night. The Director-General of Health, Ashley Bloomfield, says it's encouraging that there are fewer COVID-19 infections recorded today compared with yesterday's high. There have been 53 new cases of COVID-19, down from yesterday's 83. Dr Bloomfield says of yesterday's cases, 52% were household contacts of an existing case. Auckland Mayor Phil Goff says the spate of attacks against train, bus, ferry and security staff is shocking. The lockdown has seen 16 reported incidents involving abuse or aggression towards Auckland's train, bus, ferry and security staff. Mr Goff says people are working under pressure during Level 4 to keep public transport running. The Chief Executive of Auckland Transport, Shane Allison, says the attacks are disgraceful. The National Party leader, Judith Collins, says she can't expect other essential workers to show up to their jobs if she won't do the same herself. A socially distanced parliament with just a handful of MPs from each party will resume sitting tomorrow. Ms Collins says question time is the opposition's only chance to scrutinise the government. And finally, the head of the Otago Regional Council believes a letter sent to the Environment Minister exaggerates the state of the council. Four councillors have written to David Parker asking for his help, alleging conflicts of interest and unnecessary delays. Te reo irirangi o Aotearoa, those are your headlines. Our next news and sport update is at six. Kia ora rā, e hoa, no mai hoki mai, this is Checkpoint, ko Lisa Owen tēnei, ko taku hoa in naene, ko Nona Peltier, who is here to talk about business. Nona, tell me about these two medicinal cannabis companies that have post-increased losses. What is the outlook for the industry? Yeah, it's an interesting one. It's in this, both companies uh, are listed on the NZX. One is called Canna South, the other one is Rua Bioscience. Uh, for Rua, they announced a $4.4 million loss uh, that was uh, after tax uh, for the for the year ending June, whereas Canna South made a loss of two million over the past six months. Now both of these companies say the losses are in line with their expectations, um, and so what they're planning is to start to ramp up their product development and get products into the market next year. So they say they both have been kind of struggling a bit with the regulatory approval process and so on. But it's not just New Zealand that they're looking for uh, products to market. They're looking also to be exporters. So I guess uh, the market had a mixed reaction to these uh, companies. In the case of uh, Canna South, uh, the share price was steady, whereas when we looked at Arua, it was down about 4%. So uh, it's interesting to see what's going to, how that market will develop. But certainly uh, next year, we're going to have a lot more activity than we did in the past uh, few months. 
And Nona, the Commerce Commission wants to see improvements to the telecommunications dispute resolution system. Um, I mean, what is it looking for here? You know, this is also quite interesting. So for about a decade, the telecommunications industry, which is headed by the Telecommunications Forum, have been running a dispute resolution council. And um, but interestingly, very few people, relatively very few people, know about it. Like only 25% of consumers are aware that it even exists. So the rest of them have been sort of struggling. So wherever they can to make a complaint or what have you, they may write to their minister, they may call up the Commerce Commission, they call up Consumer Affairs or what have you, because they don't know where to go. And so job one for the industry is to improve the awareness of this council that exists and to make uh, consumers know that there is a place they can go. That's key to perhaps improving things. But what the Commerce Commission Telecommunications Commissioner said was that the number of complaints about telecommunications has doubled in five years. And one of the complaints that is not being addressed by the council that falls outside of its, um, I guess, uh, uh, guidelines is complaints about the uh, the connectivity so when your your phone doesn't work properly or your internet goes down you can't necessarily complain about that and those sorts of co- sorts of complaints are something that the commerce commission wants to see addressed in the longer term and another thing that the commission is looking for and well the industry too is that the body that looks after these complaints will eventually become independent because that is the international best practice. So there's going to be some changes over the next four years in the way that telecommunications complaints are handled for sure. And Nona, should we have a bit of a trot around the markets? Why not? Now, interestingly, uh, the US dollar really took a dive over the weekend and that was partly because uh, the Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell laid out a slower than expected path to rate hikes. And so that saw our our dollar rise. However, with the news that Auckland was going to stay in level four lockdown for a while longer, it dipped just below the 70 US cent mark, 95.8 Australian and 50.8 pence. But the Asian markets certainly liked uh, the idea that the US dollar was a little bit down and rates would stay low longer. And so the market really perked up there and our market followed our top 50 index, it rose nearly 1%, up 121 points to 13,181. Thank you, Nona. That's Nona Peltier with our business update. The alert level extension is causing frustration among schools as they try to plan for the rest of the year. And teaching through a screen is taking its toll on teachers and students with fears of burnout on the horizon. Louise Tanuth reports. The bell is set to ring for the end of Term 3 in about a month, and schools are preparing for most of that learning time to be virtual. Most are prepared for it, they've been here before, but Head Girl of Christchurch Girls High School, Amelia Tikal, says it doesn't make things any easier. Just being on our computers all day for the entire school day as well, it's like you get pretty foggy and you're at home with all of your family. Yeah, it's pretty, I don't think anybody finds doing school at home uh, a a great experience. And year 13s are worried about the last few weeks of their final year. Lockdown last time, last year, it was more towards the start of the year, so there was a lot of stuff that we knew would still happen, And but now it's like, now that everything's getting cancelled, it just makes motivation levels harder because it's like, well, what is there even to look forward to now? Tamaki Makoto is set to spend at least another two weeks at alert level four and won't find out if it'll move to level three until the 13th of September. Auckland Grammar Principal Tim O'Connor says it's impossible to plan the rest of this year with mock exams and crucial assessments looming. The problem we have is we just don't know what's going to happen next. So it'll depend on government decisions. So we're having to actually put streams of work in place uh, multiple times over. They're trying their best to keep some sort of routine for their students by holding virtual assemblies and working to tick off tasks for each day. But the biggest task is protecting his teachers and students from burnout. But look, this is going to get tiring. We have to be looking now for or predicting what is going to happen 
and looking for ways to change up just for reasons of motivation. Audible College Principal Greg Pierce says the biggest difficulty is finding alternatives to mock exams that were due to take place at the end of this term. So it won't be a classical week of uh, timetabled grading exams. It will be teachers within their timetabled blocks thinking about a variety of ways of how to evaluate student work. Last week they prepared by dropping off hard copies of schoolwork for students that needed them and laptops. Everywhere south of Auckland moves to alert level 3 on Wednesday, meaning schools can open for children whose parents or carers have to work. Christchurch Girls High School principal Christine O'Neill is expecting most students to stay home. We tend to have very few that turn up as any for level 3. Um, so we, we make a commitment to our staff, unless there were suddenly massive numbers, we keep our, all our staff delivering teaching and learning online because that's, you know, that's a full-time job in itself. And if there are any students at school, um, that's managed by a senior leadership team and a relief teacher. She's happy about that after some alarming results in their staff's vaccination rates. Talking 95% are unvaccinated. Not that they haven't tried to book, or they have booked, but they're not vaccinated at this point. And I would imagine that's probably reflective of most of the country, given the, you know, the demographic who are in the teaching profession. Last year's lockdown taught them the most important thing to take care of is well-being. They've switched the way they do things by having a 9am to 12pm timetable for students. Classes are just 30 minutes each, leaving room for healthy habits in the afternoon. So, you know, families go out on walks, students go out on walks, or they get a flow on, on assignments, teachers can plan their work in the afternoons, or they can do family walks, or they can run as we get closer to senior exams, if we're still in lockdown, they can run um, tutorials. While students and teachers alike don't know when they'll be back in the classroom, all are hoping it'll be before Term 4 starts in mid-October. And just some feedback from our earlier interview with the Whangarei Mayor, Cheryl Mai. This listener says, bless our Mayor, but she is deliberately understating some realities. One, bumper-to-bumper traffic came up Northland from points south for hours on the evening of the last lockdown. We who live here are acutely aware of the danger this posed. Sheer fortune that we did not have a COVID outbreak is not security enough. Number two, Northland is always joined to all. Auckland, that is where many of our health services are and much of our non-weekly shopping. We do not have our own services. Three, in the situation where nearly 200,000 Northlanders are islandized, and the next bit comes in capitals, we need a dedicated corridor to get past Auckland. Thanks for your feedback. Do keep it coming. Text us on 2101 or you can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ. The Bay of Plenty District Health Board has apologised for wrongly requesting passports from Pacific people in line for a COVID-19 vaccine. While there's no requirement to show ID to get a vaccine, some members of the Pacifica community say they were asked to produce their passports to get a vaccine in the Bay of Plenty. And late this afternoon, the Director General of Health tried to clear up the confusion, saying identification is only required if people don't have an NHI number. Andrew McRae has more. The DHB says requiring a passport as identification is not policy or a requirement to be vaccinated. It says it's committed to ensuring it doesn't happen again. A Pacific community worker in Bay of Plenty, Emmeline Pickering Martin, says the apology is really a non-apology and called it racist. Passive aggressive, sorry we didn't mean it like that, racism. Um, It's just like who is in charge here and why aren't these public health messages free of racism Um, and you know the whole CIR system was created so that vaccinating our people could be fast and efficient and no one needed to prove anything we wanted you know to cover the whole population so in terms of the community reaction everybody is just tired and disappointed and angry. Esther Martin is chief executive of the Pacific Island Community Trust in Toronga. She doesn't believe there'll be a backlash from the community deterring people wanting to get the jab. If anything, I, you know, our families should just be encouraged and just keep going and be vaccinated, um, go to places where they're comfortable. Local MP Nationals Todd Muller was extremely surprised to hear passports were being requested. Reflected on my own pretty seamless process of getting my first jab a few weeks back and uh, just rocked up and said who I was and my date of birth and that went where I lived and that was it. Uh, why they would suddenly need to be able to 
produce a passport seem to be sending the wrong message, uh, frankly, particularly at a time when we need everybody to be uh, um, rocking up and getting vaccinated, not putting you know, hurdles in front of people. The Minister for Pacific Peoples, Opio William Seo, says it appears to have been an isolated incident but should never have happened. He says it caused distress and hurt within the Pacific community. I'll accept that this is a one-off, but it does result in loss of trust and confidence in the system. So I'm hoping that we can just... Uh, the CEO has apologised to the Pacific community. Uh, I want to now make sure that everybody knows there's no requirement whatsoever and we can just move on. Silao Visola Sefo is Chief Executive of South Seas Healthcare in Auckland. He believes confusion around some Pacific names, particularly Samoan, might have been why passports were requested. Some of our families have different names, so they might have a title name, they, have a, they might have a chief name that doesn't reconcile with the, the name on their birth certificate or driver's licence or passports. That'll be the only reason why... Late this afternoon, the Director-General of Health, Dr Ashley Bloomfield, said vaccinations were available for anyone on New Zealand soil. He said only those without an NHI number were required to provide a passport or some other form of identification. The process of giving someone, allocating someone an NHI number can be expedited by uh, someone having identification. And my understanding in this case, this is what was being sought. There was certainly no intention, in my understanding, to single out any particular group. But I just do want to reiterate, no one is required to show a passport or other form of identification. And every person in New Zealand is eligible to be vaccinated, whatever their immigration status. Fijian Rutumans are among those asked to produce their passports at vaccination centres in Bay of Plenty, Auckland and Wellington. Community leader Fisa Itu Solomone says there's no need to segregate people. If we're talking about um, a team of five million people in our in our country, we should not be looking at uh, segregating our people, uh, especially when we're all trying to work together in the same space. Solomone says his double standards practiced when Pacifica is stopped and questioned during the lockdown, but claims the same is not done to other ethnic groups. The Chief Executive of the Bay of Plenty DHB, Pete Chandler, says 16 Pacific people came together in a pre-arranged visit to the Tauranga Vaccination Centre as a group on Friday. One of the DHB booking team realised there were not any NHI numbers on file for the group, so asked them to provide their passports so NHI numbers could be created in the system. Mr Chandler says the request wasn't to prove any residency status or eligibility. He says no one in the group was refused a vaccination. Mr Chandler says the DHB acknowledges and understands that for the Pacific community that it would have been a trigger and re-wounding of past hurts. It is 10 to 6. I'm Lisa Owen and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. In Muriaki in a pita pita kōrero, after the news at 6, the drive to get vaccinated means stocks are dwindling. So should we get some different vaccines? Immunologist and Chief Executive of the Mulligan Institute, Professor Graham Legro, joins us live. Health officials are adamant the Pfizer vaccine is safe and the benefits outweigh the risks after the death of a woman here has been linked to complications probably caused by the vaccination. A board monitoring the safety of the vaccine believes the woman died due to myocarditis, an inflammation of the heart wall, with symptoms including chest pain and irregular heartbeat and shortness of breath. It's known to be a rare side effect of the Pfizer COVID vaccine. The case has now been referred to the coroner. Chair of the COVID-19 Independent Safety Monitoring Board, Dr John Tate, believes people should be alert to complications but should not be put off getting the jab. First of all, the board would like to extend their sympathies to the women's uh, family and friends in this difficult time and also wish uh, to thank the family for their assistance under this in, under this investigation. The board that um, I chair receives all the adverse um, outcomes from the vaccine that are reported to us, um, including deaths. And then the board goes through a process where they look at whether the vaccine could be causal um, 
And the conclusion with this case was that the uh, myocarditis, which was the cause of death, was probably due to the vaccination. And what is myocarditis for the ordinary person? Myocarditis is an inflammation of the heart muscle. Um, and there are many possible causes for it, but the most common, co- the commonest cause is a viral infection. Um, and COVID itself can cause myocarditis. So why might the vaccine cause this? Well, the vi- vaccine appears to work by causing an inflammation or an activation of, of the um, cells that causes an inflammation around the muscle of the heart. Um, and if this can then affect uh, the conduction systems, this may have an effect. Uh, having said this, I'm not actually a cardiologist, so um, <laughs> that's sort of the obstetrician's view of myocarditis. Can you tell us whether this woman had COVID or she was um, healthy per se? Well, uh, she didn't have COVID, but um, we can't really comment on 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 this particular case any further because it's is under the jurisdiction of the coroner and the coroner is the one who actually makes the final decision on uh, what the cause of death is. Okay, let me put it another way. Is it possible for perfectly healthy people to suffer this complication or are there usually other risk factors involved? Uh, no, it is, it is possible for someone who's perfectly healthy to get a myocarditis. Uh, as I said, it can be caused by any viral infection um, or, as we believe in this case, uh, the vaccination. And are there any other risk factors that would perhaps make you more susceptible to this? Oh, yes. Um, that if you had some other um, autoimmune to, or immune disease, if you had other contributing factors, uh, there are other contributing factors that, that, that could make the situation worse. And is this the only case that you are aware of with a fatality with the vaccine and this condition? Yes. Okay. What, what about, what about um, non-fatal incidences of this? How common has it turned out to be in New Zealand? Right. Well, we can only comment on the ones that are actually reported to us. And we've had 32 cases of myocarditis reported to us uh, out of... 11,000 other um, uh, my, or other adverse um, react, reactions to the vaccine. And how so serious have those cases been, Doctor? What, what have been the consequences of that myocarditis? Well, some have ended up in hospital, but none that we... Well, certainly no one else has, has appeared to have died from the, the from myocarditis and myocarditis normally you get a full recovery and to the best of your knowledge the people who um, are reported as having this complication as a result of the vaccine have they all recovered that's my certainly our understanding you can probably appreciate doctor that the news of this death will make some people nervous so what would you like to say to people who are anticipating a vaccination and they hear this news. What's your message? The message, very, very strong message, is that the benefits of vaccination far outweigh the risks of developing COVID-19 or of having an adverse reaction to the vaccine. So can you give us an idea of how uncommon or common this is? Well, as I say, the figures that we've got suggest there have been 32 cases of myocarditis, which admittedly they're the only ones reported, out of probably over 3 million vaccines. So the risk is very small. What other serious side effects have we actually seen in in New Zealanders who have been vaccinated? Well, um, anaphylaxis, which is an allergic reaction to the vaccine. Uh, We have seen that, and that's why people stay for 20 minutes. How many cases of that? Uh, that's, again, very small numbers um, of true anaphylaxis because it could be sometimes quite hard to distinguish. Um, other 
potential complications which have not necessarily come up with the, with the vaccine uh, tinnitus um, Guillain-Barre syndrome a few other ones but whenever we look at them it doesn't appear to be any different from the normal background so in terms of specific adverse reactions to this uh, vaccine it's a very it's very difficult to determine which are as a result of the vaccine or which would have resulted just in other in other ways and that is Dr John Tate, and he's the chair of the COVID-19 Vaccine Independent Safety Monitoring Board. Um, to some of your feedback now on splitting the country into different alert levels. So from um, tomorrow night, 11.59pm south of Auckland, drops down a level to level three. Chris has got in touch and says, last time we were in lockdown, we live in North Waikato, the right side of the road was Auckland, level three. The left was Waikato, level two. Our kids were not allowed to go to school. The kids across the road were, but they used our driveway to catch the bus. It's just stupid, says Chris. Another person from up north says we live in Russell, Northland and almost all our neighbours' properties are owned by people from Auckland and Matakana near Walkworth, where they have permanent homes. Guess what? After lockdown was announced, they all travelled up here and are staying here now and are not sticking to their bubbles whilst here. Another listener confirms that, saying a lot of Auckland to Northland travel in the first 48 hours of lockdown. Were Northlanders returning home? No, they say. Um, on this one, uh, around the issue of requiring a passport for a vaccination... This person says, requiring passports to get treatment from DHBs. My mother was asked several times to produce her passport at DHB hospitals, Middlemore, Green Lane and North Shore included. It used to produce a lot of confusion when she produced her New Zealand passport and told them that was all she had. I was asked for ID, Bob says, at my two vaccination appointments, but I only had my visa debit card. But that was clearly an NHI number related issue as I had no clue um, that that would speed the process up, says Bob. Uh, someone from Nelson's got in touch to say, we showed our driver's licence in Nelson. No worries at all, Jen reckons. So just to bring you up to date with the numbers, 562 Delta cases in the COVID outbreak now. Ahi ahi marie, RNZ News at 6. Ko Sarah Thompson, tōko ingoa. The Bay of Plenty District Health Board says it fully understands the hurt felt by the Pacific community at 16 of its members being asked for their passports at a vaccination centre in Tauranga on Friday. It says 16 Pacific people had come in as a group, as arranged with the centre. Chief Executive Pete Chandler says that when a staff member found no NHI numbers for the group, passports were requested so files could be created. That request wasn't to prove any residency status or eligibility, but we understand and acknowledge for our Pacific community that that would have been a triggering, a, a rewounding of, of past hurts around such matters. Pete Chandler says no one in the group was refused a vaccination. The government is promising people won't have COVID vaccination appointments cancelled as pressure comes on supply. There is not enough of the Pfizer vaccine at the moment to keep up with massive demand. The COVID response minister Chris Hipkins told Checkpoint that if extra supply can't be found, the system could still deliver 60 to 65,000 doses a day, but not the peaks of up to 90,000. We might not be doing all of the uh, walk-ins and the drive-throughs that we're doing at the moment, but we're absolutely, uh, our booking system is uh, absolutely running hot, but it's also being designed so that we would never have to cancel bookings. Chris Hipkins says the government is trying to source more vaccine from other countries. The Prime Minister says that while today's COVID number is encouraging, it's too soon to know if it's a trend. 53 new community cases have been reported today, 30 fewer than yesterday's high of 83. Jacinda Ardern says it would be premature to say the number is trending down, but it's clear the lockdown is working. We are seeing a decrease in cases outside of households, a decreasing number of locations of interest, and the reproduction rate reducing. Now, all of that helps, but the job is not yet done, and we do need to keep going. 
All of today's cases are in Auckland. Ms Ardern says it's possible to have Auckland at level four and the rest of the country at level two. And the Director General of Health, Ashley Bloomfield, says there's no public health reason why it couldn't happen. Auckland Transport and the city's mayor, Phil Goff, are shocked at the spate of attacks against essential workers, including an assault on a bus driver at the weekend. Since the current lockdown began, there have been 16 reported incidents involving abuse or aggression towards Auckland's train, bus, ferry and security staff. Mr Goff says it's appalling that someone should be attacked while doing their job as an essential worker. He says people are working under pressure during Level 4 to keep public transport running. The Chief Executive of Auckland Transport, Shane Allison, says the attacks are disgraceful. Members of Ngāti Maniapoto have voted to accept a proposed treaty settlement with the Crown. They've also approved the setting up of an entity to manage the $180 million settlement. Jamie Tahana reports. Ngāti Maniapoto, whose rohe encompasses the King Country, is one of the largest iwi yet to settle with the Crown. It's taken more than 20 years to reach this point, and it's been a contentious process, with some hapū urging members to reject the proposal. Only 37% of eligible whānau voted, but Maniapoto Māori Trust Board Chair Keith Aiken says two-thirds of them voted in support. The government will now decide if there's enough of a mandate to proceed. Jamie Tahana reporting there. It's four minutes past six. Moving into sports news now, it's finally official. Two Pacific teams will join the Super Rugby competition from next year. Moana Pacifica and Fiji Ndrua will join the competition when it kicks off in February. The 12 teams will play 14 regular season matches with each team hosting seven games with the conference system abandoned. The top eight teams will qualify for a three-week playoff format with the final on June 18th. Wooden Spooners, the Waikato Bay of Plenty Magic, will be a force to be reckoned with come next year's ANZ Netball Premiership with another international signing. Defender Katrina Rory will join fellow New Zealand players Amelia Ann Ekinacio, Bailey Mez and Claire Kirsten at the franchise. Rory confirmed earlier this month that she was moving to Rotorua and leaving the Wellington-based Pulse. I never thought I'd play for any other franchise but it's the only team that I was um, willing to go to as I didn't want to travel, um, we weren't going to move, this is where we're based now. Um, so it was, yeah, the magic or nothing for me. The New Zealand swimmer Sophie Pascoe will seek to defend her 100 metres backstroke title at the Paralympics in Tokyo tonight. Pascoe, who won the S9 event in Rio, has qualified third fastest after finishing second in her heat. Jesse Reynolds is also in the S9 100 backstroke final. Meanwhile, Michael Johnson is into the 10 metres air rifle SH2 final, having qualified in second place. And that's the news. Coming up this week on Nights, we mark Ernest Rutherford's 150th birthday of science historian Olga Suvorova. A military historian Damien Fenton remembers the South American war that nearly wiped Paraguay off the map. Shrebanarian's on the line from India. And Australian satirist and author John Saffron, who once upon a time took on God, now he's taking on big tobacco and the vaping industry. So join me, Brian Crump, all week after the news at 7 on RNZ National. Te reo irirangi o Aotearoa, on air, online and on demand. Now the short forecast from Met Service to Midnight Ra to Tuesday. For Northland, Auckland and Coromandel Peninsula, scattered rain with some heavy falls and possible thunderstorms easing later tomorrow. For Waikato, Waitomo, Tomaranui, Bay of Plenty and Taupo, fine breaks and isolated showers. Gisborne to Wairarapa, mostly cloudy with isolated showers. Taranaki to Wellington, including Taihape. Scattered showers clearing this afternoon and fine breaks increasing. The odd shower possible about the Wellington south coast again tomorrow morning. For Nelson, Buller, Westland and Fiordland, mostly sunny with a few showers about western Fiordland tomorrow. For Marlborough and Canterbury, cloudy periods, isolated showers clearing tonight except about the Kaikoura coast. For Otago and Southland, Areas of cloud clearing and becoming fine tonight. And for the Chatham Islands, cloudy periods with showers developing early tomorrow. That concludes the short forecast from Met Service to Midnight Ra to Tuesday. It's seven minutes past six.
Kia ora rā, Sarah. No mai hoki mai. This is Checkpoint called Lisa Owen TNA. The government may have to manage demand for vaccines after a rush to get the jab following the latest COVID outbreak. There are now 562 community Delta cases, 547 of them in Auckland, 15 in Wellington. Since the outbreak, the government says the vaccination rate has peaked at more than 500,000 a week compared to pre-outbreak weekly targets of, uh, targets of about 300,000. There is 840,000 Pfizer doses in the country right now and the next large deliveries are not due until October. So how could we manage these doses that we have left? Well, joining me now is immunologist and chief executive of the Mulligan Institute, Professor Graham Legro. Hi, Graham. G'day. Hello. Kia ora. Um, I'm wondering, is it better to give everyone one jab rather than using what we have left to um, double vaccinate a smaller group of people? At this point, given the fact that we're so vulnerable, yes, I think it's really important we get everyone one jab. I think that getting that bigger coverage, 50, 60 percent of the population having at least one jab, because one good thing about the one jab, it does stop death, dying and, 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 and hospitalisation, which is the thing that we're really afraid of here in New Zealand. So if you may were making the call and you had to um, call demand, would that be a step that you would seriously consider yes, going to yeah. one jab for everyone first? Yes, um, I would throw the book. I throw the vaccine, you know, uh, textbook to, at, at this business right now because you've got to remember we're one of the few countries in the world with no uh, community transmission of the virus. We're completely vulnerable. Every other country has various cooking up of different viral variants, and we're quite vulnerable now. We need to get vaccinated relatively quickly now and put all the good efforts and organisation we have into work getting vaccinated as quick as possible with one shot. There are no cases in the South Island right now, right? But there are, um, even today, a mass vaccination event. Should the government be concentrating more on areas where there is the outbreak? And I know this this may... Um, be, well, offensive to some people, but do we need to consider putting a pause on the South Island for vaccination and making sure the entire of Auckland is vaccinated first? Um, I'm not the logistics expert and I don't want to muddy the waters, but I, it's hard to say because you could argue it's good to get the South Island done because they're just as vulnerable for an outbreak to come from Australia next week. So that's what we're actually concerned about. And in Auckland at the moment, with all the constraints and just trying to trace and track and, lock and, and restrict the movement and spread of this virus, it may be easier to first of all do the vaccine in the South Island, then go up to Auckland when they've got it under control. We're in a pretty tough situation right now, so it's uh, do where it's easiest, I think, and get as many people vaccinated. Is the, this should be the name of the game. We have um, contracts for Janssen and AstraZeneca and they have had MedSafe approval. What would be the scenario in terms of mixing and match matching vaccines? If people have had one Pfizer shot, is it OK to give them a second shot using a different one of these vaccines? Yeah, actually, we're really lucky. We can now look at some of the small clinical studies which have been done by Comcov, a group out of Oxford and Southampton. They've actually trialled all the different scenarios, Pfizer, then AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca, then Pfizer. Um, they haven't been able to look at the Janssen one yet, but by all immunological rules, according to the textbooks, that should be OK too. It's one of the really interesting features about our human immune system. It really makes a very good immune response when you actually have the same thing but change it a little bit. And actually having a AstraZeneca followed by a Pfizer is actually very good. I'm just wondering, we're looking at a lot of modelling at the moment, right? There's Too much modelling, in my opinion, actually. OK, tell me about that, Graham. Well, I think that... They're really good and actually it's a good way of projecting. But just think about, do you trust the economic modelers to tell what the economy is going to be like in two or three years' time? It's very hard for them because there's so many variables. And the same with this virus. It's hard for the modelers to predict the Delta virus and how good it would be at getting past the border control. And I think it's very good to sort of work out once you know enough about the virus and the way it behaves to model things. But we're in a situation where there's a lot of variation. There's a lot of unknown things with the way the immune system will react to the virus, the way the virus is currently changing. So if, in your view, we're overusing modelling, what is it that we need to do to jump ahead of the virus? I think you've said the right word. We've got to jump ahead of the virus and understand it's a virus 
and we're, it's, it's constantly evolving and trying to find ways to survive. And we've just got to get our immune system primed up. So I think, I think it's been good up to now, the strategy. It's been really good. It's protected us, and it's been really good at preserving our humanity. But now I think we need to run a bit faster and put some of the resources we have and, and focus people's minds about getting vaccinated. It would be really important to do that now. We're in a race now. So, so jumping ahead is really good to do. So if indeed we are left waiting for larger deliveries of Pfizer, would it be your strategy to get in these other um, vaccinations, COVID vaccinations, that we already have approval for? I think it would be. I think there's no risk. Um, of course, the studies that I'm just quoting, they're just being published. Um, uh, they, in comp- they'll be done by reputable groups, small numbers, but still enough indication that it's much better that they're not having people vaccinated and another virus coming across the borders. It's only a matter of time before we have two or three more coming through. So let's use everything we can. Throw the whole toolkit at it. We can get some AstraZeneca, borrow some of those Aussie AstraZeneca, I think think there's 10 million doses, get it over here and let's get started if we're short of Pfizer vaccine for the moment. Professor, if we can't get Pfizer, do you have a preferred second option of the ones that are available? What one would you go for first? AstraZeneca, because it's been proven to be do no, no much more harm, but actually works very well in combination with the Pfizer. Now, I know you guys were working on a vaccine as well. Could, could that yes. be ready in time for us to have boosters with your vaccine? Well, yes, because I think uh, we know already with the Pfizer vaccine, it's good, it stops death, it stops hospitalisation, and that's what we need to have right now. But later on next year, it's probably likely there's going to be a waning of immunity and we're going to need a booster. And I think it's a really important decision. We want a good booster. And that's where the New Zealand vaccine operation, you know, VANS, has actually been focusing its attention, getting a booster, getting ahead of the virus and actually having a booster against the Delta virus and against some of the other strains. So we're in a very strong position to give long-lived immunity that gets the things that are surviving after all the early vaccination attempts. Graham, how far off do you reckon a New Zealand-made booster is? Oh, we, we aim, we're currently presenting plans to the government. We aim to be clinically trialling this time next year. Um, so we'll actually have some results around safety and, of course, a rollout for the... Which is actually a good time immunologically because people will be protected for about a year. But then we'll begin to go into uh, uh, an unknown territory about what will be like, what the variants will be like. So it'll be really good to have both the New Zealand version against the Delta virus plus other overseas ver- versions which may turn up and see how that best works with the Pfizer vaccine. So Graham, when you say you've got a proposal or you're putting a proposal to the government, is that to get funding for a, a clinical trial and next steps or approval? Um, it's always funding, I'm afraid, but yes, um, of course it's funding and it's actually keeping the programme together and going forward. I think it's very exciting, but this not, um, but this does not focus on the New Zealand version. I think we need to have a strategy, the New Zealand government needs to have a strategy for getting that idea around what is the next booster shot. And for people here in New Zealand to get used to the idea, they will need a booster next year. And it's not a big problem and it's not a failure of the Pfizer vaccine. There's actually just... The way the virus is, the way the virus is changing and trying to escape from Pfizer, and we just need to be ready and have some strategies already ahead, waiting for the virus and whatever comes at us. Jump ahead. You said the right word before. Always good to talk to you, Graham. That is Professor Graham Legros, who is from the Mulligan Institute. Budgeting services are warning people not to get carried away with buy now, pay later products if they're struggling to get by. Official documents show that following last year's Alert Level 4 lockdown, there was a significant uptake in buy now, pay later usage compared to uptake for other credit products. Now, budgeting services are seeing more and more people suffering hardship as a result. But the sector continues to balloon and is currently outside of any New Zealand credit legislation. Emma Hatton reports. Stephanie started using Afterpay a couple of years ago, using it to buy the odd thing when she didn't quite have all the cash up front. Then she discovered their rewards scheme. But then they introduced me to Pulse. So the more you spend, the more Pulse you get. Pulse is a a reward so that you um, don't have to have the money up front. Their first payment comes in two weeks after you've bought the items. With Pulse, you build rewards the more you spend. Soon, Stephanie was hooked. $10 off your $50 purchase at Glassons and things like that. So I might not need anything from Glassons, but oh, $10 off. <laughs> I'll have a look and see what they might have. 
She quickly began buying more than she could afford and faced multiple repayments adding up to more than $200 a week. She prioritised making the repayments over paying other bills in order to hold on to her rewards ranking. And I was doing all my shopping around Afterpay, around Pulse and what I could get and our food, um, pet needs like flea treatments for my cat. Like I'd get an Afterpay for my meat, I'd have eight weeks to pay for it. And the food was gone in a week. She's since sought help from the budgeting service Christians Against Poverty and is working her way out of debt. A spokesperson for Afterpay said Pulse rewards customers who spend responsibly and its whole business model is based on individuals being able to manage their money. But Michael Ward, a social policy advisor with Christians Against Poverty, says it's a real concern that buy now, pay later products aren't regulated in the same way as other credit products. One of the key lender responsibilities in New Zealand is that lenders make sure that loans aren't going to be unaffordable. With the buy now, pay later products, they are not subject to those same affordability assessment requirements. So there's a real risk that more people are going to be taking on these loans that they're not going to be able to afford to repay. Previously, officials didn't see the sector as a significant cause for harm, and so they weren't included in changes made to credit laws. But official briefings this year show the Minister for Commerce and Consumer Affairs is getting more and more reports from budgeting services that they are causing hurt. Jake Lilly, a policy advisor at FinCap, says they're worried about what they'll see at the end of this nationwide lockdown. Financial mentors have really been reporting since that first lockdown a lot more complex cases coming through the door. So it was almost immediate and they've just noticed a a constant trickle of people getting into these more complex issues with debt. For instance, just having so many overlapping at the same time, which is a real risk with buy now, pay later products. The Commerce and Consumer Affairs Minister David Clark says officials have been asked to monitor for significant increase in the use of buy now, pay later products, which could indicate concerns. He says buy now, pay later providers are working to establish their own industry code, but the ministry is also working on a discussion document that will go out to the public soon for consultation. However, any regulation that might come into effect will still be some way off and will be too little too late for those already caught up. It is 20 past six, you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. A major drive is on to get young people vaccinated against COVID-19 at a pop-up clinic in Dunedin today. The focus is on young Māori and Pacifica, but is open to the whole community. Our Otago Southland reporter, Timothy Brown, went along. The numbers are stark. Almost 62% of cases in the current outbreak are among those aged under 30. Concerned at the lack of urgency in vaccinating young Māori and Pacifica in Dunedin, university students worked with Naitahu-owned health provider Te Kaika to organise today's clinic. University of Otago Pacific Islands Students Association President Melissa Lama says young Pacifica and Māori have links to Auckland and Wellington, which brings the current outbreak into focus. Although we're not in South Auckland or we're not in Wellington or in Auckland in general, their kids are here. Their family members are here and uh, not only that, we, we've got a part to do and that's sort of our way of acknowledging that how serious this issue is, how the serious the pandemic is and um, I just wish that you know there was more value put upon for us to have this done earlier. She says the perception young people and young Māori and Pacifica in particular are not doing their part is wrong and this two-day vaccination drive gives them a chance to prove it. I think for us this is the best thing we can do right now is ensure that we get vaccinated but in doing that we want to address the, the any anxiety and uh, I guess concerns that students have uh, in regards to this COVID vaccination so we're just trying to provide a space that's culturally safe um, and also show that a Māori and Pacific led space is also open to everybody. Te Ropu Māori Tumuaki, Karamea Pifarangi says that's why a clinic for young people by young people is so important. You know, I was also in the same boat as um, feeling a little bit anxious about um, going and getting vaccinated. Um, And what's important to us is actually seeing our whānau and our friends and our um, community there to support us and, and encouraging us to come and get vaccinated. A team of 300 student volunteers put their hands up to assist in getting their peers to the clinic and checking in on them after the jab. Karamea Pifarangi says it shows young people putting their hand up to play their part in fighting the pandemic. There's a whakatauke and it says, um, ko te amorangi ki mua, ko te hapai o ki muri. And, you know, although we're the amorangi ki mua, um, 
There are so many halfway walking ready. 20 cases of the current outbreak are now linked to Auckland University of Technology and many sites around the campus are flagged as locations of interest. Te Kaika director Matapura Ellison says that shows the importance of vaccinating young people and particularly vulnerable Māori and Pacifica. Student life involves uh, coming together in class and if there's, a, if there's a chance that we are actually helping to uh, mitigate that risk I think that's uh, money well spent and resources, i.e. vaccine, uh, well utilised. Among those getting their vaccines were University of Otago students, Te Awanui Waka and Hini Moa Watani. The pair, both originally from Te Ika a Maui, the North Island, say it's about protecting the community. Well, I did it not only for myself, but my whanau and family, really, and as a community as well as for New Zealand just to um, be vaccinated and, you know, get out of lockdown and get back to the normal. I just to play my part as part of this community and, you know, give back to those that have been working behind the scenes, you know, our frontline workers, so making sure that their whanaus are protected. The clinic will be operating at the stadium again tomorrow from midday until 7pm. One of the most powerful hurricanes to hit America's Gulf Coast has slammed into Louisiana. Hurricane Ida brought winds of about 240 kilometres an hour and is expected to cause widespread devastation. President Biden described the storm as life-threatening and is urging people to pay attention to instructions from officials. The BBC's Nida Tafik has this report. Dangerous winds whip New Orleans as Hurricane Ida continues its destructive path. The streets all around the city and its famous French Quarter sit empty. From this point on, residents are on their own for the duration of the storm. Earlier, masses rushed to the airport to evacuate before it shut down. Many others took to the road. We have two kids in the car. They're both 12 months. We really wanted to evacuate for them. Like best case scenario is like power outages um, and some like minor flooding. Worst case, I don't even want to think of that. Eight feet of water inside. For Kenneth, this brings back painful memories. He evacuated during Hurricane Katrina and came back to find his home underwater. This time, he says Ida's fast approach left him with no time to leave. And you still think no matter how strong your infrastructure is, there still might be that little chance that levee could breach. From space, images capture Ida's magnitude. It came ashore with 150 mile per hour winds and is causing life threatening storm surge. In Washington, President Biden received a briefing on Ida at the Federal Emergency Management Agency. He said his administration would put the country's full might behind recovery. Everyone should listen to the instructions from local and state officials just how dangerous this is and take it seriously. It's not just the coast, it's not just New Orleans, it's north as well. The rainfall is expected to be exceedingly high. The region's new storm defenses, which failed during Hurricane Katrina in 2005 on this exact date, will be tested like never before. But even with protections in place, Ida is expected to have a catastrophic impact. As week two of the Paralympics gets underway in Tokyo, the COVID situation in the city continues to get worse. There are now at least 10,000 seriously ill people waiting for hospital beds, and more than 20 COVID patients are reported to have died at home this month. Hospitals say they can't cope with the growing number of serious cases, let alone an outbreak in the Paralympic village. The BBC's Rupert Wingfield Hayes has been travelling with a medical team as they fight to keep patients alive and try to find them hospital beds. In the back of the car, Dr. Kazuma Tashiro is trying to find a hospital bed for one of his COVID patients. In this densely packed part of southern Tokyo, there are now dozens of COVID patients who need to be in hospital but can't get a bed. Dr. Tashiro and his team are a literal lifeline. In this block, a 61-year-old man is very sick and on oxygen. So the last night, I called him to check if he was alive and he, can, he could talk with me at that time. But this morning, I couldn't uh, talk, with his, talk with him by phone. So I'm very anxious for his healthy con conditions. <laughs> as soon as he enters, it's apparent the man is alive. It turns out he hasn't been able to pay his phone bill, so it's been cut off. He's also removed his oxygen mask 
And as he checks, he finds his blood oxygen level is very low. He's saturated SpO2, the you know, blood oxygen level is only 92%. It is not good value. So I, I put the oxygen mask to his mouth. Right. And please keep it to protect your life. And, and, and what's, what's going to happen now about his bill? Ah, this is a, phone, uh, phone, a telephone bill. Yeah. Uh, he is living alone. So he, he couldn't pay the telephone bill uh, because of the, you know, his very bad condition. Right, right. So I, I got, I received it. And now uh, I'm going to the you know, convenience store to pay it, pay for it. It's the arrival of the Delta variant here in Japan that has led to this explosion of COVID cases. If you look back to mid-July, there were around 1,500 new cases a day. By mid-August, that had jumped to 6,000. And now we're seeing the same with seriously ill. At the end of July, Dr. Tashiro and his team were treating just one seriously ill person. Last week, that had jumped to 50. The format for the 2022 Super Rugby season has been confirmed, with Moana Pacifica and Fijian Indrua joining the five New Zealand and Australian sides. Super Rugby Pacific will start next February with 12 teams playing a 15-week regular season. While the Indrua will be based in Fiji in the future, it's likely they'll spend the 2022 season in Australia due to Fiji's ongoing problems with COVID. The competition will be played between at least Australia and New Zealand. Zealand next year. New Zealand Rugby's Chris Lendrum concedes that leaves it open to being affected by the COVID pandemic and travel restrictions. We've got the, our core teams based in two nations. Um, we'll have to look at options down the line, but if that scenario comes into play close to the time, we'll deal with it like we have in the last two years. He says the NRL and A-League are examples of tournaments that have had to adapt and have relocated entirely to Australia. Everybody who um, has signed up to this competition knows that's a possibility, um, and uh, but clearly not the preference. And we'll jump that bridge if we come to it. Lendrum is confident both Moana Pacifica and Fijian Indrua will be competitive, though he concedes they will face some struggles in the first year. Um, before we head off, just a reminder, tomorrow, Tuesday, 11.59pm, south of Auckland goes to Level 3. Northland, you have to wait a bit longer, 11.59 on Thursday, if all your tests come back clear. Auckland, wow, hunker down, Auckland. At least two more weeks and then a reassessment on the 13th. Let's hope that's not an unlucky number for us. Um, that's all we've got time for. The Late News team will keep you updated throughout the night. Ko te kaupapa tuatahi o pōpō tomorrow from 5 on First Up. It looks at the social media call to action from New Zealanders to provide clothes and shoes for Afghan refugees returning from Kabul. Ka pai tōpō, have a wonderful night. Kia ora tato, RNZ News headlines at 6.30, ko Sarah Thompson tōko ingoa. Government modelling suggests if the country hadn't moved to alert level 4 when it did, there could have been 500 community COVID cases today, rather than 53. Auckland will remain at alert level 4 for a further two weeks, while the rest of the country south of the city border moves to level 3 tomorrow night. Military personnel at a Navy accommodation facility at Devonport in Auckland have tested negative for COVID-19 after Delta was found in wastewater. And Harpoo at East Cape have set up a checkpoint claiming there's 